Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like the show, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review. Now you can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and Help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. All right, so last week I mentioned that I was going on a quick business trip to Mississauga and Ottawa, Canada. Um, the trip went fine. Thanks for asking. Uh, but something funny happened, as something funny always happens. This was an all-work trip. And I figured there was going to be zero time for extracurricular stuff, so I brought no podcast-related gear with me. No microphones, no digital audio recorder, didn't even bring the little promotional postcards that I usually carry everywhere. After all, you know, I was going to be speaking at a pharmaceutical outsourcing conference in Mississauga, then meeting with Health Canada's Division of Cost Recovery Fees, and I don't think any of them were really going to want a postcard of, like, Roz Chast or Vitold Ripchinsky, you know? So I finish up the meetings, go to the Ottawa airport, and read for a while because I got there crazy early. And there was a bit of a weather delay. There was an announcement about the flight that was so unintelligible that I, I thought I was on the MTA. So I went up to the counter to ask what they'd said. Turned out to be a call for a few passengers whose passports they needed to check. Then I turned to head back to my seat and noticed that I was standing next to Graydon Carter. Graydon Carter, outgoing editor of Vanity Fair, co-creator of Spy Magazine, owner of the Waverly Inn. I just blithely walked right by, pretending not to know who he was, and I found an out-of-the-way corner of the terminal where I could strategize. Now, not having those promo postcards with me meant I was going to be at a bit of a disadvantage if I tried to pitch him on, on doing the podcast, which, of course, I had to do. Um, see, the last time I was in a Canadian airport, and adjacent to a, a perfect podcast prospect, it was David Byrne. Um, and I didn't have the nerve to chase him down and, and pitch him to, to do the show and give him a postcard. Now, especially with the flight delay, I knew I, I had to. So I bought a copy of the new issue of Vanity Fair at the newsstand because I wanted to show some support for the, the brand. And and then I wrote a note with my name and email and the, the name of the podcast, a little description of it, just, you know, a uh, uh, literary cultural weekly conversation show, or something like that. Uh, the URL, um, as well as some past guests who might impress him, or at least be people he knew and would not be um, as obscure as some of the guests who, nonetheless, I love to talk to, but aren't necessarily at the head of the editor of Vanity Fair's imagination. So I wrote that up and then I walked over to where he was sitting and I said, Mr. Carter, and sort of flashed the cover of the magazine. He nodded and I said, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I just want to tell you how much I've enjoyed your work over the years, all the way back to college when I was reading Spy Magazine. And he lit up at the mention of that. Um, and he thanked me. And then I told him about the podcast and how I'd love to sit down with him for a conversation sometime. Um, I knew he was transitioning out of Vanity Fair, maybe when he's in his new incarnation, whatever that is. Um, and I gave him the note with the info on it. He, he looked at that and then he thanked me and he said, yeah, maybe in six months or so once I'm resettled. Which 
I, of course, took as an unqualified, yes, and let's be best friends from now on, Gil. Uh, Maybe not that strong, but at least it wasn't a no, which was important to me. And I thanked him and then headed back to my spot so I could take care of some day job work to to deal with. Then once our flight was finally called, we both went up together. Um, I asked him what book he was reading. We shot the breeze about that. I mentioned the one that I had just finished and kind of praised that to the heavens. You'll hear the... um, You'll hear about that book in a couple of weeks. But anyway, while we're standing there, he said, you know who you should interview, Gil? And he suggested a friend of his with a a new book out. And I wrote the name down and told him I'd check it out once I got home. In fact, I've followed up with the publisher subsequently. Um, And then we just started bantering about mutual acquaintances and had some laughs over a few of them, who I won't name here. Um, Also, I should note, I was in one of my fancier suits this Paul Stewart one that's that's this gorgeous shade of blue, white pinstripe, peak lapels. I was wearing a, a marled gray turtleneck with it instead of a, the dress shirt. And I said to him, just so you understand, Graydon, I don't always dress like a dandy. I just kind of did this for work. And he, he laughed and said he liked the suit, which, to be honest, really does look good on me. It was like the fourth or fifth person to tell me he liked the suit in those two days. Anyway, anyway, um, we talked during the whole long walk to the plane and then we split up at, at boarding. Um, I said, if you don't mind dropping me an email, I'll get in touch next year, see if you're up for recording sometime, uh, which I felt was classier than asking him for his email because uh, it's carrying all sorts of implications. Anyway, he said he would, and you know, we'll see where that goes. So it sucks I didn't have any cards to show off the, the past guests, but you know, there were enough names there that you know he knew where I was coming from. And plus, I'm I'm just kind of happy with myself that I could like drop into an easy conversation with someone who's connected to just about every person I'd like to record a show with. And um, that was kind of a neat feeling. Anyway, on with the show. This week's a double episode. Uh, my first guest is Eshkol Nivo, the Israeli author of the, no- well, of the novel Three Floors Up, which is published in translation by Other Press. It's new in the States. It came out a few years ago in, in Israel and a few other countries. It's fun. It's it's a well-written novel. It's entertaining. It tells three very intricate and interesting stories. Um, I don't want to tell you too much because we actually go into the plot and the mechanics of it during our conversation. Um, I will say Three Floors Up gave me a a sense of contemporary Israel in a way that I maybe haven't had in my life lately, which sort of made me think it's kind of way past time for me to visit the family over there. Anyway, well, I don't want to tell you any more about it. Um, You'll, you'll get it. There's some caveats here. Um, First, uh, we recorded in the rocking horse cafe in Chelsea, New York. I want to thank them for giving me a table to record that was in the back of the restaurant and for turning the music down a little too. Still, there was lots of New York noise, so I sampled out some of it, which leads to some audio artifacts. Also, um, at one point, I refer to my old man as a con artist or a con man. That's unfair. Um, I meant more like hustler or operator. Con man carries a certain connotation that, you know, isn't warranted in this case. Um and that's all you need to know. Our second guest is Paul Gravette, who returns to the show after three plus pretty eventful years. We'll talk about that segment after Eshkol's. Here's Eshkol's bio from the Other Press website. Eshkol Nevo is the author of five novels, all bestsellers in Israel. Three have been published in English. New Land, which was included in the Independence List of Books of the Year in Translation, and World Cup Wishes, and Homesick, a finalist for the prestigious Independent Foreign Fiction Prize. In 2008, Nevo was awarded membership in the Israeli Cultural Excellence Foundation. He is the owner and co-manager of the largest private creative writing school in Israel and has mentored many up-and-coming Israeli writers. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Eshkol Nevo. One of the things he said when we started, and I'd seen it in past interviews of his, was um, Israeli authors are only allowed to write about four topics, mm-hmm. basically, Holocaust, World War II, kibbutz, and terrorism, mm-hmm. uh, which he felt incredibly constrained by, and mm-hmm. it's sort of why he pursued genre writing and science fiction and other, other mm-hmm. areas. 
as an Israeli writer, do you find yourself constrained in terms of, you know... Not at all. Yeah. I can understand why a genre writer would like to uh, explore markets that are bigger than the Hebrew-speaking and reading market. You know, it's, uh, I guess if I would have written sci-fi, I would, I would feel the same, but I feel free to, about, to write about whatever I like. Some of my novels um, examine or are asking questions about Israel's uh, day-to-day life or you know, like modern Israel issues but some of them are like three floors up are more into understanding the characters their families their relationships how what ticks people what triggers them what what is what are their obsessiveness mm. and i don't actually i never felt constrained as an israeli writer i i can't say that i felt a, a need I would say there, I felt that there are some issues that have been we, Israeli literature has dealt enough with. <laughs> yeah, I would yeah. not write about a kibbutz. Okay? Yeah. I can put a scene in a kibbutz, yeah. but it's not an issue. For, I, 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 or second generation Holocaust. Not Holocaust, of course, survivors are widely written and widely read, but even the second generation is, uh, has been dealt very you know, dealt magnificently by, by very talented writers. I don't feel an urge to write about it. So, rather than constraint, I felt, uh, you know, challenged. Yeah. Okay, let's explore yeah. other stuff. Yeah, how do you characterize Three Floors Up in terms of, I would say in terms of what you're trying to achieve, and it's a horrible mm -hmm. thing to ask a novelist, you know, mm -hmm. so what's your book about? But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I... By the way, I was asked this question, you know, where... Dare I ask where? In the uh, in the airport, in the passport uh, place. <laughs> she was asking, "What are you here for?" I said, "Business." And she said, "What business?" I'm a writer. What book did you write? Three floors up. <laughs> what is the book about? <laughs> oh, mm, I, I was. I can imagine I did, on the spot. That's a tough yeah, question. Actually, I didn't know what to say, but I think she felt pity for me and she let me go. <laughs> <laughs> say, yeah. Portrait what, of Israeli life, mm, maybe. Portrait of the, the, the three aspects I, I of, of the human mind. Yeah, I th and I, look, I, yeah. I was. I never think of writing as something that I want uh, or to achieve with, or to use writing to achieve something where a book wants to pass on a message. But I can tell you my my favorite response from readers, and this book has been published in. Uh, Four countries, uh, Israel, Italy, Greece, and now in the United States. And I'm in the end of my book tour now in the United States. My favorite response is readers tell me, I read your book and now I can uh, forgive myself. Interesting. Now, sometimes they do not even tell me what. Yeah. But I think it's a very non-judgmental book. The characters are flawed. They make mistakes. I was not falling in love with these characters while I was writing, which usually happens to me. In this book, it didn't. Yeah. They, you know, they irritated me, and I could <laughs> empathize with them at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think looking back, now it's two years since the book has been published in Israel. While writing it, and even in publication date in Israel, I could not really explain what was this book about, why I wrote it. Now, in perspective, I think this, it was about acknowledging the imperfection of, of, of your existence in, in family, in relationship, where you're doomed to make mistakes as a parent and as a, you know, as a spouse, you say. Yeah. And, um, and I hope it, it transmits, you know, it, it uh, transfers into the reader. And of course, everyone takes his own, has his own take. It, uh, psychologists love the structure, yeah. the Freudian kind of uh, mm -hmm. structure. Judges react to the moral, judges or lawyers that read the book re re react to the moral aspects of it. Italians feel that uh, uh, first four are known as an Italian macho, so they, can, they know this guy. <laughs> and for some reason, 
I don't know why uh, Greek people in Greece really love the second floor with the issues of being a lonely mother. So every well, I thought it was more about real estate scamming and, and hiding money from people might appeal to the Greeks more. But, but anyway, yeah. That, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. Money, money, yeah. Somebody asked me today in, in, here in, the, in New York so about uh, was I inspired by the Madoff uh, pyramid system. And, yeah. I, and actually, we have our own Madoffs oh, in Israel. Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's yeah. We, had, we have He, he learned from, from, yeah. from the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I say this because um, my family's Israeli. I'm, mm -hmm. I, my father came over with my mom in 65 to, mm -hmm. to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I still believe it's largely because my father, for the most part, is a con man. Mm -hmm. And I think he felt it would be easier to con <laughs> Gentiles and to con a nation full of Jews. That, that was sort of the, uh, I, it, clearly everybody here is on their guard. I'll go to America where they don't. Yeah. And Were so you I think, born in Israel? No, no. I was born uh, here. They came over 65. My brother was born 68. Mm -hmm. I was 71. I, I have also been, 71. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to yeah, say, yeah, yeah. there are occasions where I have the... Um, the sliding doors or the alternate reality mm. versions of myself that I meet in, in some of my guests <laughs> where, or, um, yeah, other, other people I've met in life where I wonder, could that have been me if I did yeah. this instead of that? Yeah. Um, my last Israel trip was 84 for my bar mitzvah. Mm. So that was, you know, I, I know I have to go back. All my family is there. I've got almost no one in North America, yeah. but, um, but yeah, I think the main What's your family name. Uh, well, let's see. I'm Roth. My Roth, my, Gil Roth. Yeah, yeah. My father's brother's, for some reason, both have Roded, Roded. instead of Roth. They came over yeah. from Romania in 47, mm -hmm. circuitously, mm -hmm. um, and ended up in Laud, where the houses happen to be conveniently empty, which I know is the theme of, of another one of your, your books yeah. that I need yeah. to, to read after mm -hmm. this. Um, whereas my mom was 1940 in London, Zionist family came over, kibbutz, mm -hmm. um, worked for El Al, met my father, etc. Giving you my whole crazy history, which you know somehow mm -hmm. ties into... To, our shared reality here. Did your psychology background play into the thought behind Three Floors Up? Was that sort of a working out of your your own history or your own training and, and a, a sort of an alternate world for you? Uh, actually, it, it took like the road not taken uh, of yeah. being a psychologist. That, uh, you're always in connection, like you just said, you're connected to your road, road not taken. Uh, like you imagine your life as an Israeli. I imagine my life as a psychologist if I would have taken this road. Yeah. Uh, but I have to say, I didn't realize until deep into the writing process that I'm writing this structure of, yeah. uh, of three floors of the, of the soul. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if psychology was an inspiration, actually I would say... Uh, I it's, think a double, it's, a, it's a double, it's ambivalent, because it is an inspiration in yeah. the book, but it's also, I have a lot of uh, criticism in this book, yeah. on psychology. Uh, like, look what we have. Like, Anon is going to a psychologist with a Yelet to, to find out what happened with their daughter. And the psychologist just, you know, they, she doesn't really tell them anything important, and she he really is pissed off. Yeah. He said, are we paying 500 shekels, like $150 for this? And when he was pissed off, I was also pissed off. I thought, yeah, that's what, why don't you tell them what you think, you psychologist? And then the second floor, you have someone who was really, was really connected to her therapist, and then she calls her and she did, she's dead. And she, and she says, honey, she says, what a nerve to die on me like this. Like, I, I need you now. now. And, and then, of course, at the third floor, you have Dvorah, which is a judge, and she's, she finds herself in a, in a psychologist who are demonstrators, and they try to analyze her, but she has un an unsettled business with the whole field of psychology. We won't, you know, we won't tell your listeners because yeah. it will spoil yeah, their joy. But, but there's a lot of criticism. I, I had fascinating meetings with psychologists after this book came out. A couple of conventions that I was brought, and, and, and basically, they shared the criticism and they had a lot to say about it. And of course, they understood me. <laughs> Understand where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah, they, Probably they, you have pain inside they of you. They knew your hidden motivations behind it. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's also, yeah, it's a book. Yeah. I got strong responses from therapists about it and mm -hmm. strong responses from uh, people who come from the law area. And yet at the beginning, it was essentially characters and story? It was even, even... Because it's more it's very, intuitive than that. Because it's very conscious of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Each mode is told to someone, mm -hmm. and it's, it's very conscious in terms of being constructed like that. I don't mean in a mm -hmm. artificial way, but simply, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're aware right. that 
that is book the, one is being told to a, a writer pal book two is the letter book three is the uh, yeah. or part three is the the, the messages yeah um, it's yeah I think confessions are stories you know, yeah. confession is uh, supposed to be a truth the truth but actually it's a story we tell and we want to achieve something we are manipulating our listener in a way we want to get something from the story and actually the, one of the alternative names for this book is That we didn't choose in the end was think of it as a story this is what Arnon tells the yeah. writer think of it as a story C- can you please write a happy end for me yeah. even though it's real life mm-hmm. but I didn't begin so structured the beginning was very I would say unconscious in a time that in my life that I wasn't even planning to write I w- had other stuff to do and I was w- wanted to open the creative writing school we always dreamed dreamt of open opening and and then suddenly Arnon kind of entered the room and started talking and it was not that planned I, I actually I, I kind of freaked out when I finished <laughs> you read the book yeah. you know why yeah. I freaked out from the first floor and I thought that's it I can't touch this this is dangerous stuff and I kind of decided to bury it and then then I couldn't bury it that I had to write again the second floor and then I understood the structure and then it became structured okay. but all this took quite a while mm-hmm. so it, I know this book seems structured I but I but really the writing process was yeah. actually the most explosive that I ever had less structured in all of my books till now Interesting. usually I'm more you know in control of what I do have you been writing since I've been working on anything since and does it mirror that sort of pattern for you Or yeah, have you been on yeah, hold it's since... Yeah, but it's a secret. Yeah, well, secret. I'm not going to ask you what you're writing. I just yeah. mean, is, is it's the... It's even, more, even yeah, more... Are you feeling that same... Has this been a breakthrough in terms of how you write? Um, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's too soon to tell. I can tell you I felt I was doing something new. Not... I, I, I always try to do something new. I, I, at least I tell myself a story that this is completely different from the other books. Mm-hmm. And I think the new thing about this book is... is uh, really writing characters that are not l- uh, uh, lovable from first sight. Yeah. And storytelling is, in a way, it's, it's, it's present in all of, all of my books. Are, I, I like a good story as a reader. I like storytelling in life, oral storytelling. I like to tell stories with music. I like to write, I'm writing a A theater play I wrote a theater play a script I like telling stories um, but I think I was trying to do something new here and uh, this is what this is the reason I published this book I felt there's something new done here and even though it felt I don't know uh, um, it was not easy to publish it in here because it's not a biographical book mm-hmm. is that an nothing happened no, nothing happened in Like nothing from taste, there is, but it's yeah. a very personal book I felt exposed when it came out in Israel no in translations it's just yeah. fun yeah what is that translation process like for you I mean I know obviously you speak English better than me mm-hmm. um, but that process with the Italian with Greek with with this letting go yeah you know I don't know if you have this game in uh, in the uh, United States where you it's a childhood game where you close your eyes and like leave somebody has to catch you yeah it's the same it's they the try same. and do that for team building sort of exercises and offices and somebody always ends up just smacking his head on the <laughs> <laughs> but yeah out of trust in America yeah you know yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, it's that I, I trust them yeah but translating into a language you know as opposed to one you don't know is that a it's different of course yeah. I, I have I read this translation I, actually I read it in one night in, of jet lag in Mexico and I, I Embarrassing to say, I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice book. And that guy wrote a pretty good book. Yeah, yeah. it's nice book. <laughs> and I, I'm very lucky with my English translator. She translates... Uh, now, in the book tour I, I, I did, I, I, I read from the book out loud. And I had the opportunity to feel the music. How does it feel? Yeah. She, she's really, really close to the original. Mm-hmm. And, she, and I have a wonderful translator also to Italian. Um... A woman a, a mother and a daughter is translating me together and I know my Spanish translation is good because I know Spanish I can read Spanish and that's it Romanian Turkish German French I don't have a clue 
Yeah. I hope for the best. Still, you're way ahead of Americans since we have at most one language uh, for, for most of us. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I know you also uh, was reading a past interview. You either read or speak Arabic? I can read Arabic. Okay. I, don't re I can't really have a deep conversation yeah. that I can read. But yeah, so that's four or five languages you've got down. So yeah. make me feel like more of a heel. But you know that that that's fine. I had Hebrew when I was a little kid, but I lost all that when my parents. Yeah, one month in Israel, it's and it's back. Yeah, you have to come for your your uh, your podcast. I figure I, I, I get out there. One week in Israel, and you have so much material. If my wife wants to visit, I figure I'll I'll you know get to see some sites. But let me ask, uh, how often or how many times you've been to America? Many times. Okay. I was here as a child. Mm -hmm. I was four or five. My parents were so spending a bunch. years. Okay. And then I've been book touring almost every year, the last six or seven years. And this time it's different because I have a very strong uh, publisher behind me. Sure. Usually I just I, I do readings. You just uh, show up. I, at, I show up at yeah. mainly at Jewish communities and mm -hmm. I... I've been talking about books in, uh, in Israel, but uh, this time it's a bit different because it's, you know, it's a, a new book. With the Except truth. you get stuck with me, some schlub from New Jersey, but no, otherwise, no, you know. It, actually, it's, actually, <laughs> you have to understand that if, if it's your 30th uh, interview at the same day, it can get really annoying. Yeah. But, but it's all for me here in the United States, it's just in, everything is in the beginning of it. So, are they looking at bringing some of your previous books? Maybe, you know, maybe okay. that's what we you were, were meeting your agent about, before. Yeah. So, I, I was going to ask in a movie so, deal. Anything? This, this one is really received very well till now. So, everything okay. is new. Every every uh, review that my you know my publicists send me, I really cl I closely read it mm -hmm. to understand in what way do Americans read this book. Is there any difference? That's yeah, what I want. The to Italians me, or Israelis or Greeks. You get to me. It felt. Um, I want to say Israeli without any any you know qualification for that. Mm -hmm. Simply in terms of the the uh, the cultures each one of the lead characters is coming from, mm -hmm. and some of the um, the worldviews they have or the the choices they make. Some mm -hmm. of them are just universally human, and mm -hmm. yet they're also you know tied into being Israeli or having certain aspects of of Israeli life. But the question I wanted to ask was. What do American Jews think they know about Israel that they're completely wrong about in, in general? Like what, have, what have you encountered with how Americans see where you're from and the, the preconceptions they have? Is there a, a sort of common thread or a certain uh, thing you have to correct them about? Or, or are you too polite to do that and you just sort of notch it away and think, okay, Americans are going to think... No, I'm Israeli. I'm not polite. Yeah. Uh, well, again, stereotypes yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah it <laughs> depends on... You know, it's... It's really a generalization what you're asking me to do. Because there's this difference between people who are connected to Israel through their children and visit mm -hmm. a lot, so they get a, a you know a realistic uh, kind of picture. And I don't ones have who to are less geographically them. connected, but, but yeah, uh, they range from um, being extremely positive about Israel uh, and uh, looking at it as if it was still in the 60s, kind of a romantic way to look at my country, and, the, and then you could get the other end, which is being highly critical without really understanding the Israeli psyche, without really understanding what is, uh, how do Israelis feel, how complex is the conflict we are living in. So you get all sorts of reactions, but generally speaking, <laughs> In comparison to what I get in Europe, so it's, it's that was a piece my next of cake, question. You know, yeah. do, do you find more much uh, more challenging yeah. because because uh, there is a strong connection between Jewish Americans and Israel, birthright people. I meet with them once a year. These kids, most of them, when I ask ask them, is it your first time? No. And if it's not their first time, it's not the first time of their parents. And of course, you have ex-Israelis like your family who are connected, so sometimes they speak Hebrew at home. So to me, coming to uh, the Jewish communities, or, or there's always ex-Israelis in, in the audience also, I, I'm coming home, you know, it's yeah. my home, my home ground, yeah. you know, my base. It's much more tough than to, to speak with a, I don't know, with a British audience, uh, with a lot of anti-Israeli kind of sentiments. Some of them are, you know, some of the criticism is right, I agree with, but some of them is totally not connected to reality. So this get, can get tough. Yeah. Like, uh, no, I actually feel 
I used to feel, I think 10 years ago, I used to feel kind of, it was kind of the, the romantic uh, vision uh, people had about Israel was kind of funny. Uh, but, but it changed. Maybe it's birthright doing it, I don't know what, but something much more, people are less surprised from what I tell about Israel. Hmm. They're less, uh, in the, my first book tour in, in, in the States was 2007 and 2008. I, sometimes I felt certain communities, not in big cities, that, that I was shocking the audience with uh, all these Israeli conflicts they haven't heard about. Yeah. But now, now less, I, I sense. I, I definitely think reading modern Israeli literature is a very good way uh, for those who are fascinated by this country to understand that sometimes, like the demonstrations we had in 2011, some people may ask, and, uh, and maybe also in Israel they ask, how can you do big demonstrations without talking about the conflict with, with the Palestinians? What's wrong with you? Well, half a million people in the street, that's tons of times uh, bigger than uh, Occupy Wall Street, so what, what is it all about? Uh, and, and, then, and then you try to, to, I think you can learn by reading, and, and you can tell people that Israel has many issues, and, and it depends on the time uh, that you're writing about, the time in this, that this novel is happening in, the issues that were rising were issues that was, were economical and also kind of uh, thought about the future of Zionism. What, kind, what is Zionism for people that were born in the 71? Okay, I was born in, in a country of Jews. It's not a big deal. Like for me, I, I, this is my starting point. Okay, we have a country for Jews. There is an independent territory, but what is its values? What does it stand for? What do we want to go? What, these are the questions that my generation wanted to ask. And this was discussed during these demonstrations. Um, and in order to break the, the ordinary distinction we have between left and, and right in Israel, which is all about the occupation, we, we didn't open it up, at least not at the beginning, because we wanted many people to join the discussion, religious and non-religious, and everybody should like for, listen for a moment. And that was amazing. That was, that was the amazing thing that happened in the demonstration in 2011. And for a long time, I was looking for a storytelling kind of way to tell the story. And, and then when I thought of Voa, which is not a typical demonstrator, I thought this could be interesting. She's going to be cynical about it. She's going to be critical about it. Okay, I can write it. Through. And much older than and much older the, the character. She's older. seen the cycles go by yeah. for all the... Yeah. Uh, the, the um, yeah. 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 The naivete, I guess, of some of the, the, the younger protesters. Yeah. She's already seen how that stuff can be disillusioning. Yeah, and, and, and nevertheless, she's affected. Yeah. Something happens to her. Mm -hmm. uh, I, was, I was 20 years older than, than most of the demonstrators, more uh, experienced than them in political uh, movements and, and failures, and yet I was deeply affected by it. Changed, in a way, changed my life. Started my uh, non-profit organization of creative writing, became much more political, and so I was looking for a way, for a way to reflect it. Um, I don't know if it answers your question, no, no, but it, uh, it, got, it, it got us into uh, this is what an I interesting do. The conversation. Just kind of yeah. kind of unfolds, yeah. especially when it's an Israeli and an American Jew. <laughs> um, do you know anyone who voted for Netanyahu? Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Only because oh, I, yeah. I, I never met someone who really. Do you yeah. know anyone who voted for Trump? Now I do, yeah. In my, my small town in New Jersey, it turns out there were uh, a bunch. I would say my father, but I don't think he actually voted. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Netanyahu but, is really, really good at, <laughs> at understanding the Israeli psyche. He works, because I worked in advertising many, many years, including uh, I worked for three months for one of the big spin doctors in Israel, just, you know, learning the profession. Um, I'm just envisioning an Israeli Malcolm Tucker. I don't know if you've ever seen the show uh, in the or the thick of it, the, uh, the BBC show. No, uh, Peter but Capaldi, but... the guy who plays Doctor Who, spin doctor mm -hmm. for the Prime Minister in the UK, and he just mm -hmm. curses and screams at everybody. So no, not this kind you, of guy. Much more. If you make him Israeli, it's yeah. manipulative. Much more Good, yeah. subtle and manipulative. <laughs> yeah. And I was learning, and, and I think what, you know, Netanyahu is, is understands that Israelis are uh, fearful people. It's hard to understand when you're outside of Israel. 
because it seems like a macho gun toting. Yeah, you know, it's 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 a mach- we are the strong side of this conflict. You know, we yeah. have the army; they don't. But in the in every Israeli, there's the Jewish gene of like, where should I flee if something goes wrong? And when will the goyim, the Gentiles, when do they come and do a pogrom? You, you understand that's that's me. Like my of wife, who's, who's Gentile, doesn't quite get the. So, honey, you know, there's there's only one country in the world that will take me when, when this all falls apart, you yeah, know, and we're yeah. hoping that'll still be around when this all yeah. falls to pieces. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, we share this kind of Yeah. Heritage. When you're actually there, I don't know what you, what you think of as the escape hatch. Oh, but, of course, you know, New Jersey. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think Netanyahu understands this really well, and he manipulates it. And, and the big challenge is to be able to create an alternative, which will be both reassuring or, or giving people the sense of confidence that there is uh, security and giving them what Netanyahu is not giving, hope. Some kind of horizon, some kind of future, some kind of change that we are yearning to. In many fields, including, you know, the call of confidence with Palestinians. If we get this kind of, this kind of leadership or this kind of competition, Maybe, maybe the result of the elections will be different the next the next election. So, anyway, it's politics. Or uh, you just wait for him to get indicted and and. But that's, anyway, that's I that's. Know. that's <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, what did advertising? Well, what habits did you have to break from your advertising background and training when you went into writing? And mm-hmm. what habits actually turned out to be useful, or what mm-hmm. what skills? Did you work in advertising? I was a trade magazine editor for uh, almost twenty years. It's trade magazine. Oh, business to business magazines. Mm-hmm. So you know, like a, a magazine for uh, you know business readers mm-hmm. as opposed to the general public. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm a lobbyist for the pharmaceutical industry. Really? That's my day job. Uh, oh. This is what I do to keep myself Oof. sane. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a weird what little... Kind of, what kind of drugs do you sell? Well, unfortunately, none of the good ones. But my guys are, are a weird little subset of the pharma industry, so they're not the, the evil pharma guys. They're uh-huh. the... Um, they're the guys who just make the drugs physically for Teva uh-huh. and guys like that, as opposed okay. to Teva and, and yeah. the guys who actually market the drugs. Um, but I used to do a magazine about those guys and then became a, I started a trade association for them and discovered I had to register as a lobbyist. The cops are coming for me right now. It's, 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 <laughs> uh, so yeah, I deal with the federal government and the FDA and, and all this for part of my day job, which is why I enjoy getting away and doing something like this. Mm. Um, but yeah, I worked in, in trade magazines. Within the first couple of issues of the, the big one that I helped launch, I realized that almost every article was basically saying that communication is key to a win-win relationship. Mm-hmm. And that that um, I started to lose my mind over because they weren't actually saying anything in these articles. They were just repeating the same jargon and, and mm-hmm. business speak. So I was wondering, from your perspective of, of writing that sort of stuff, um, more from advertising than, than uh, article placement, mm-hmm. did it take a while to, to get away from this is how I would write if I was in advertising, but now mm-hmm. I'm doing creative writing? And were there any parts of it that actually helped what you do now? Discipline, yeah, re- was really helpful because when you work in an advertising agency, I've been doing it for sixteen years. But when I worked, yeah, it you didn't, had deadlines. It didn't yeah. really matter if I had a bad day, mm-hmm. if I broke up with my girlfriend, if I didn't sleep, uh, if I, you know, if I, if I didn't like the product. Nobody was really interested in that. I had to, to write copy, manufacture a text. Uh, and and to be judged and criticized on a, on a daily basis by everyone, starting from my boss and his boss and the boss of the boss of the boss and the client. Yeah. So a lot of discipline there. And till this day, I I I, I when I you know when I'm in a writing time or in writing periods in my life, I, there's it's very disciplined. Sit in the morning, start writing, and I stop writing. Just, uh, Two o'clock when my um, um, raging teenager comes home, <laughs> and that yeah. and, and it's very I say rigid or yeah. I'm assuming the teenager is a kid and, and not a wife, but but anyway, go go yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's my 14 years old. Good, good okay. And, <laughs> yeah. So I have no question about it. I, I think maybe this is the reason I've been able to write um, several novels since I started writing because I don't stop. 
to pity myself and to say, Ooh, writing is hard. I, I'm there. I'm, I'm there and I'm writing and I'm working. And sometimes I will write a short story or a lousy poem or a script or, you know, I will do, I will write, I will work. So it's discipline. And it's also, it's not only because of advertising, because I, I grew up with, in a family of you know, workers. There's no, no things such as you know, vacation. What is vacation? Yeah. <laughs> it's a week vacation? Week. Yeah, yeah, it's vacation. No, we don't like vacation so much. My father, my father used to work to, uh, during vacations. And my mother used to laugh when I asked her about a future vacation. And we work. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, you could sleep when you're dead. <laughs> yeah, that's it. very Jewish. <laughs> um, so this is one thing. The other thing is I... I think I got from advertising the understanding of how important it important is an image. Yeah. Now you can create also images with words. In advertising, you work with an art director and you're, you're a team and he's mm -hmm. responsible to the image. I'm responsible to the, um, to the text, but in the book you are both. I, I'm creating my images. I am thinking visually when I write. And I think this came out of these 10 years in advertising. I, this, I learned how to think visual because originally I'm a very kind of verbal, wordy kind of person. And, and it changed me a little bit. And now I, I imagine more um, detailed and concrete scenes when I write. So this, is, this is what I took out of it. And, and the bad habits are you are used to get reassured very quickly just like a like like you do yeah, like, like on button. Facebook like yeah, a post yeah. and this I found out, find out this is a big problem with my students right now in creative writing workshops they post something on Facebook they get 1,000 1,500 yeah. uh, likes and then they are sure that this is a masterpiece okay yeah. and then I, I have to tell them look this, the language doesn't work the characters doesn't work and actually it's not really funny as you think and uh, they've really hard yeah. time accepting this criticism so yeah. again I learned slowly not to, it's like running in a way like, like learning how to run like the Morikami book about r running long long distance mm -hmm. I learned to breathe differently not to run and show whatever I've written to anyone just to get feedback to get yeah, yeah it's cool so I the incubation got longer and longer and longer. And I learned how to hold it for a moment, hold my horses. And but actually, I was even when I was in Alvarez, I felt like you know, I felt like I'm not really writing what I want to do or what I want to write. So in that sense, I. I you have to get rid of habits of uh, trying to please anyone or trying to sell because I already hated it. So for me, writing started, or literature started in, as a rebellion against my work. Like you were with well, this, I, I was rebelling. How did you uh, get from getting out of advertising uh -huh. to actively selling your writing? Like your, your prose writing from, I from there. Well, was there any sort of conflict there? Did you have any sort of, oh, God, i got to go back into the market as opposed to, you know, I'm writing for the joy of writing? Um, or did you always have of, the it's mind? It's kind of, of a fairy tale because yeah. I, uh, I was writing. I started writing and I was writing after work or after work times. Then I cut one day off I, and, I, and I kept only, I was working only for four days and one, the remaining day I was writing. I wrote my first book, published in Israel, and then it sold 2,000 copies, so I had to continue working, but I already, you know, the revolution has already started. Okay? I already hated my job, <laughs> looking for an opportunity to get away from it, and then my first novel, the first one was short stories, and the second book was a novel, uh, Homesick, and this was a huge bestseller in Israel, and then I, I got kind of confident enough to leave. Um, and for years, I feared the moment that I will have to come back. Yeah. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm not afraid anymore. And nobody would take me anyway. <laughs> oh, God, him? Him, yeah, this old guy? No. So I, I'm, I consider myself very lucky to I have been able to write, to teach creative writing, to book tour. So, you know, I, I, if someone would have told me when I was 28, Kind of a, a wannabe in Tel Aviv, wandering in Tel Aviv, 
uh, if someone would have told me that this is going to be my life, I know, so yeah, that's that's kind of yeah, fantasy, that. nice fantasy. Yeah, I mean, is it possible to make a living as a writer, it solely as no. a writer? Okay, because no, it's no, impossible in America, no, which I'm sure you've, you've heard. If you're a hard worker, you can do all sorts of things. So, yeah, actually, I I don't want to be dependent on writing uh, per se. Because then you start thinking, hmm, is this book going to sell or not? And I don't want these kind of thoughts. Yeah. So I write whatever I like. I hope it will go well. It has been going well. Um, like, since my since Homesick has been going well. And But, I, you know, I teach. I, I give lectures. So... Yeah. Yeah, talk the answer to the question uh, is no. But, yeah, I, I but, assume but somehow, that was the case. you know, you you're get able to patch by. it together. Well, I get by with a little help from my friends. Right. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, most writers I know in the States, it's, you know, the writing is one thing, but it's teaching, um, you mm -hmm. know, pitching articles yeah. or, yeah. you know, holding more mundane day jobs instead. But, you know, so I just wondered if, you know, if the scale is any different over there. And I assume not, there totally is no not. paradise to, to pull this off. But, no, no, but I, I never yeah. expected it to be like yeah. it. Yeah. For See, me, that's, that's the thing. I, I, it's, it's probably because you held a, you know, a regular job for so long, because most young writers have this vision that they'll be able to make a living the, solely by that. Yeah, Safran Foyer, uh, kind yeah. of. Uh, yeah, I never had it. I never Good. had it in mind. <laughs> I still don't have it. I, yeah. don't, I don't fantasize. You know, I had a very, uh, I would say, formative moment. Forma formative. Formative. Yeah. Formative yeah. moment with Amos Oz. He was my teacher. Yeah. And I, I, I took a class. He was talking about Agnon teaching Agnon as a writer and I wanted to, uh, I approached him and I wanted to brag, I wanted to tell him that I have quit my job in order to write my novel. So it, he already had a really long line of women wa waiting to talk with him, mm -hmm. so I had to wait till all the women left and then it was only him and me, <laughs> and do you know, Amos uh, I just left my job and now I'm only writing. And he just uh, looked at me and said, I never only write. I only, only write, <laughs> so what's only, wrong only with written. <laughs> and then he went away. <laughs> it was like, I said, okay. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't think it's healthy just to write. I think it's, it's you have to have this balance in life between things you do. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the teaching and the establishing a, a mm -hmm. writing school? Because I'll ask some more granular questions about that. But, you know, what was the impetus to... Uh... I've been teaching for 17 years now. Yeah. And I, 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 I knew I am going to be a teacher. I wanted to be a teacher since I was a teenager. It was quite clear to me, much more clear than being a writer. I think it's a very powerful way of affecting people's lives and affecting even society. So it started on a small scale. We've been doing it for like 13, 14 years on a small scale, like a boutique kind of workshop, only in Tel Aviv, only private houses. And then came the demonstrations, and we did a workshop in the demonstrations. Then afterwards, we, we, the workshop was about writing a protest poem together mm -hmm. with all the people. Like there were 100 people, half of them drunk, half of them stoned, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, or, you know... Uh, full of uh, energy, and uh, and we and we did it. We wrote this poem together. We went through a line, and then we sat afterwards, and we thought, "Wow, this we have to get out of our safety zone. We have to do something. We have so, we have power. This is a power. If you're able to teach creative writing, you're able to make people uh, to give them something. It's a power in, that we have, and we're using it on a very small scale. So." Uh, so then we, we decided to do something which is nation nationwide. And we decided we wanted to be non-profit because if it's only about money, you would never go out of Tel Aviv because yeah. Tel Aviv people can pay a lot. Outside of Tel Aviv, it becomes... Oh, my trade association is a non-profit also, largely for the same reason, because there are things I could do that would make shit tons mm -hmm. of money, but then I would be doing the things for the sake of the money as yeah. opposed to the cause of, of what I actually do, which sounds ideological for a lobbyist, but mm -hmm. trust me, it all adds up. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I get what you're, yeah, you're coming from. A, that you but, can't. but actually it works, yeah. because now uh, if I can show you our newsletter, can you, you can't read Hebrew. I can but, transliterate, okay. but you know, that doesn't get me anywhere. You, you see, there's, <laughs> it's a Robin Hoodic kind of method. You, you, mm -hmm. Workshops in Tel Aviv are, are expensive. And workshops around the country are cheap. We so get subsidized. subsidized by us and by 
we do a lot of cooperation. We do a special uh, workshop for blind, for the blind, for the lonely soldiers, for uh, less privileged youth, like uh, adult, young adults. It's a, it's a social organi organization, and I'm very proud of it. It's taken three, two or three years of my, of my, of my life, <laughs> having been writing for a long time, until we took a, kind of a CEO, and, and, and she's running the business, uh, and, I, and now I can write again. Um, but it came out of the feeling that besides creating you know, published writers, we have 50 published writers. We are Israeli record holders, <laughs> uh, 50 published writers, some of them really successful, really good. But actually, even people, if people do not publish a book after a creative writing, something happens to them. Talking about Israeli society, they become more tolerant. This is the problem of our society, aggressiveness and intolerance and prejudice and, and labels. <laughs> so in a workshop, all of these are, can be a little bit cured in a way. Not really cured, it's not like the pharmaceutical, uh, <laughs> you don't get a pill of tolerance and then it's yeah. like this, but it's, it's a pill of tolerance. Yeah. Well, I, I did an interview a few miles north of here with Daniel Goldhagen, a scholar who did, um, mm -hmm. he did the book Hitler's Willing Executioners, but mm -hmm. his follow-up years later was um, about global anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. where he found the, uh, let's see, the Arab population with the highest opinion of Jews was Israeli Arabs, because they're the ones who are actually interacting with Jews on a daily basis, as opposed to, you know, Arabs from any other region who had, mm. you know, this this level of, of tolerance. It was one of those things, the more you're around other people, the more you, Definitely. especially in writing, the more you have to think into someone else's perspective. Definitely. I can imagine that's, you know... Actually, we're having our first Arab-Israeli uh, student this semester. Uh, that's what I was going to ask. Have really you, tough. Is it able to, are you able to really bridge Really tough. We are able to bridge, you know... Religious, non-religious, poor, rich, periphery, center, old, young. But that's the women, taboo. men, and Arabs, Jews is really, really, really slow. We are having our first one now. We did a course in Arabic, which means like teaching Arabic our Jewish students, and we cooperated with uh, an Arab uh, NGO. <laughs> Um, but it, What's it's, the, the it's, bottleneck? It's not easy. It's not easy. There's a lot is of bridges to build there. Is the bottleneck that the Arab potential students wouldn't want to participate, or they that the Jews wouldn't want them in like there? Like issues with this. Yeah. And I just also, know, like, which they, side they, they, is more and resistant? Also, some of them want to write in Hebrew. Some of them, like Said Kashua, mm -hmm. some of them write, want to write in Arabic. And I, 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 yet, I cannot. We did not find the right teacher to cooperate with. Some of yeah. them do not want to cooperate. Some of them. So it's we'll we'll yeah. we'll win this in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I just wonder which side is tougher to, to is is causing more it, trouble. No, that, that's that definitely. Even though. Yeah, I don't mean it. In that's a bad the biggest way. challenge. Yeah, that's the biggest yeah. challenge, and we will get there. It's, I think it's all a matter of, like, like in, in, uh, in negotiations between Israel and Palestinians. It's all a matter of building. The trust, like that, people who understand that they are welcomed. I had I had one girl signing, and then she cancelled a couple of days before. That I said, why? why? I, well, I'm, I'm the manager of the school, but I, I thought this is important enough. So I called her. I said, why, why did you cancel? And she said, look, it's now a time of terror, uh, terror attacks. I'm, af I, I, I'm afraid I will not be welcomed in the class. I said, don't, don't worry, you will be welcomed. You will. Open-minded, we're liberal. Of course, you will be welcome. And she, and she said, um, "Okay, and, but no, <laughs> I'm not coming." And and it's so it's a build. Yeah, we have to build the trust slowly, slowly. Yeah. You are in America for well, you're in New York for our first terror attack in in quite a while, mm -hmm. um, and you're also here for you happen to overlap with something that came up when I was researching uh, about your reading past interviews with you, the lack of education you would get as a, a young student in Israel about the Palestinian perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, your education would have been, you know, 30 years ago uh, plus. Um, but we're having the same thing where we're uh, getting in the U.S. that recognition that how we portray the Civil War in mm -hmm. education up north is very different than it's it's portrayed to, to other states in the, the country. Yeah. In what way? It's the War of Northern Aggression. 
of no northern aggression okay. uh, is is how it's portrayed down there's a romantic idea about the rebel soldiers and up north it was no they were defending human slavery and we had to bring them in line and those those two visions do not reconcile so this and you still get this this way in the south yeah northern aggression yeah my my wife who's from louisiana said yeah no it was portrayed as you know these great romantic that, rebel federation soldiers federation flags are still uh The other place you'll see Confederate flags, um, which <laughs> I didn't understand the meaning of until I, I Googled it later. Um, I was in Germany for business and taking a train cross-country and saw a Confederate flag hanging from a, a house outside. That's kind of weird. Turns out, when you can't fly a swastika, mm -hmm. you fly a Confederate flag instead okay. in Germany. I thought, well, that's... makes sense in a perverse way. Okay, that, that explains why mm. they're, they're doing what they're doing, but, you know... Um, Uh, yeah, here it's still seen as something other than the defense of, of human slavery and, and white supremacy. Um, but again, it just like depends on who's educating you and, and what the curriculum yeah. is as to how you end up seeing the world or you know what you're given of the world until you go out and start learning more for yourself. Um, there was no question in that. I just figured I'd leave that out there. But, no, but it, it relates yeah. to, I tell, you, I tell you about, maybe you read it uh, yeah. before, but... Uh, Homesick is part of the education system in Israel. Yeah. You have to make an, you, you are tested on my book. If you are into li studying literature, and in this book you have the, the, Nakba, the Nakba narrative, the 48 Palestinian side of the story. Yeah. And it was quite revolutionary in that sense. And it is still provocative because students in Israel, when they go to high school, they are not told about the Palestinian side, and then they not in history lessons and then they go to literature lessons and they, they read my book yeah. so they, they get it in, in their face mm -hmm. and there's a lot of discussion in classes I, sometimes they invite me fascinating fascinating to see how easy is it to actually make people listen mm -hmm. maybe they will not agree but maybe they will not accept maybe they will, will not affect their politically uh, you know stand but they But they're, they'll Again, know that that opinion is out there. Yeah, they are willing to read about, about Sadek, the Palestinian construction work, and, including right-wing settlers. That's what literature can do. It can surprise you from an angle that you're not ready to. Yeah. Yeah. I will say... Oh, sorry. Yeah, thanks, sir. Um, and I don't know if it's something you, you use as a joke at all in Homesick, but mm -hmm. the previous owner of my, my family's house and, and lodge showed up years and years later um, not to reclaim or anything but just to mention that oh you know my father before we left he buried whatever treasure you know in no the fucking way it's a scene in homesick is it okay because I assume that's a standard joke because it's my father and his two brothers sat there digging through everything and couldn't find which I, we're pretty sure the Palestinian guy was fucking with them and basically told them that's this so that they were just okay, good I'm, I'm glad that's you, you have to look for it that, that's what I fi I was going to ask if that's something that's a, a common story for, it's for a, an guys, absurd so. scene yeah. in, in homesick that I won't tell you no, no, it develops but. into a Anarchy, <laughs> and, but I, I won't tell you. You have to look for it. It's yeah, my I'm favorite scene. Good. It's, it's a scene actually later on. That's an amazing story. There's this Palestinian leader in uh, in Germany. Uh, he lives in Hanover, and he read my book in Arabic and in German, homesick. And then he decided he's, he's going to do an event. Palestinian. He ended up organizing this event mm -hmm. with Jewish and. Palestinian community together at the same hall and they were putting on stage an adaptation to this scene that you, were, you, you told me as a joke yeah. and it was amazing it was amazing it was during one of the Israel uh, Hamas wars and I was sure that they were going to cancel it but Israelis and Palestinians when they are outside <laughs> <laughs> yeah when it's not get along in, in, beautifully yes. yeah. because there's you have no, something in common yeah there's no territory point. to fight about yeah That's, yeah yeah how um You and I both lived through the Cold War. We mm -hmm. both know what it was mm -hmm. like with that, that mm -hmm. general specter of annihilation mm -hmm. over our heads. Mm -hmm. How do you live under an iron dome? Under? Under an iron dome. How, how do you live in, in, dome, in, uh, in Israel with that? A volcano, near a volcano. Yeah. yeah. I mean, do you see that as a... Are you able to step back from that and, and sort of correct your behavior? Is there that sense of, you know, we could uh, end at any time. But On one level, I think... Um, 
repressal denial is, is necessary to be an Israeli. You have to uh, create some kind of bulb around you and, and, and ignore, yeah. or at least uh, commit to living uh, a normal life or a day-to-day -day life with your daughters, with your friends. On a deeper level, I, I think, and I have written about it in a book called Neuland, that all Israelis are in a way uh, suffering from PTSD. This fear I was talking about uh, that is easy to manipulate is not only because of the Holocaust and the genes, the Jewish genes, it's also because of the wars. There's always a, a fear of war. Because we had uh, recently a couple of summers with wars. I, personally, I can say that every June I become a little bit nervous. Because I know maybe, maybe. And it's, it's a dreadful experience because uh, Having, having daughters and being a father during the war is, is, is suddenly, they, suddenly they understand in what kind of situation they are living in. I've tried trying very hard to hide it from them, yeah. make them think that it's a normal place. That they, you know, and then they find out like two years ago that no. So, um, do you ever think of I think I think day to day life, I have a lot of, you know, I have fun with my friends. I'm part of a flourishing uh, art scene or, or storytelling scene in Israel, uh, involved in a lot of things that are going on. Tel Aviv is a wonderful city, a very liberal city. Um, creative writing workshops are packed. And yet, it's... Uh, Always on it's, the it's edge abnormal. of destruction. No, it's abnormal. Of, yeah. I guess yeah. What you experience right now on a, on a you know, very tiny scale, I would say, this is our life. So, um, I sense it's really, I, I can sense it's really sharp and evident when I'm away, <laughs> I'm away. Then I come to Manhattan and there's someone who runs people <laughs> again and there's sirens of ambulances. Yeah. So you can't really get away anymore. Yeah. Maybe in Australia. Maybe yeah, Australians uh, have yeah. some kind of peace of mind. Yeah, but um, then you have to be around Australians. Do you ever have you ever thought of living anywhere else? I can't. Okay. I really can't. I yeah. You seem as though you're, you're deeply connected. Yeah. I love the place. It pisses me off. This, this is my language, my friends, um, and there's and part of this community. It's not really a community because everyone is is alone, but I, I feel that there is a, um, in a way, because there's no real opposition in Israel. The recent, I would say, six or seven years, of, no, there's no opposition. The opposition is competing with Netanyahu and being more right wing than him. Yeah. So I feel that I'm part of something that, that artists have become the only, the only oppositional voice in, in the country. So I feel also kind of, I would say, responsibility is a big word, but I feel that it's, um, I'm part, I want to play in this game. I want to take part, even if I'm losing. I want to take, you know, take part in this game. Yeah. This is my, this is my, my field, you know, it's my home ground. Mm -hmm. So I want to participate. Um, give my share. I could enjoy spending uh, the hot Israeli summer in Middletown, Connecticut. <laughs> I can imagine it being fun, but uh, and I guess it will happen for a semester or two. But uh, no, not more than that. No, no, I don't have real thoughts of immigration. Understood. Eshkol Nevo, thanks so much for coming on the thanks. Virtual Memory Show. Thanks. And that was Eshkol Nevo. He's got no website, no Twitter feed, and no Facebook presence, near as I can tell. But his new book is Three Floors Up from Other Press. Homesick also sounds great, um, especially because of that that little conversation we had of what I thought was an idle joke about the uh, repossessed Palestinian houses. Anyway, um, I'm hoping to get to that at some point this winter. Now, our next guest is Paul Gravett, who I recorded with in early 2014. Paul's got a new book out to accompany his new exhibition, Mangasia, 
Wonderlands of Asian Comics, and that's the main subject of our conversation. Now, the caveat is that we didn't have much time uh, because I had to head out to record with Martin Rosen, so, or Martin Rosen, sorry. Uh, so this one's kind of rushed, and I sort of let Paul go in terms of talking about Mangasia, both the book and the exhibition. Uh, here's Paul's bio. Paul Gravet is a London-based freelance journalist, curator, lecturer, writer, and broadcaster who has worked in comics publishing and promotion since 1981. After graduating with a master's degree in law from Christ College, Cambridge, he spent a year and a half in the USA, mainly in New Mexico, contributing to Albuquerque's local public radio and television stations. He's had an amazing career publishing cartoonists like Eddie Campbell, Jamie Hewlett, Neil Gaiman, and Dave McKean through Escape Magazine, and serving as director of the Cartoon Art Trust, a UK charity established in 1988 to preserve and promote British cartoon art. He's also organized retrospectives on artists like Jack Kirby, Tove Janssen, and Posey Simmons, as well as theme-based exhibitions like Comics Unmasked, Art and Anarchy in the UK, Comics Creatrix, 100 Women Making Comics, and the new Mangasia, Wonderlands of Asian Comics. Mangasia opened in Rome at the Palazzo della Espezioni, Espozioni, um, and continues to other venues in 2018, including Le Lou Unique in Nantes, France, followed by a global tour of Europe, North and South America, Asia, and elsewhere for the next several years. Paul is also the author or co-author of several books, including Manga, 60 Years of Japanese Comics, Graphic Novels, Stories to Change Your Life, Great British Comics, Celebrating a Century of Ripping Yarns and Wizard Wheezes, and The Leather Nun and Other Incredibly Strange Comics. He also edited the Mammoth Book of Best Crime Comics and 1001 Comics You Must Read Before You Die. His new book is Mangasia, The Definitive Guide to Asian Comics. Paul Gravett was nicknamed the Man at the Crossroads by Eddie Campbell and hailed by the Times of London as the greatest expert on the graphic novel form in this country. We've got a much longer bio up, if you can believe that, at the show page for this episode, so check that out at chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Paul Gravett. But tell me about the new book. Tell me, it, yeah. should we call it Mangasia? Mangasia, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Only because I worked on the FDA Safety Innovation Act, and we all called it FIDASIA, but within the FDA, they called it FIDASIA, yeah, which bothered it, me a lot. But this, I figure... It's you know. going to move. I mean, certainly at the opening of the exhibition that relates to the book, with uh, it was in Italy uh, mm -hmm. just a few weeks ago in Rome, and, and there, of course, they call it Mangasia. Yeah. So I had to put that accent on when I was doing some of the interviews there. Yeah. But <laughs> and, of course, in, in France, it will probably be called Mangasia. Uh, that's, 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 in fact, that's, that's we have a universal language that's so, mispronounced by everybody. That's yeah, it. so the word's going to move around a little bit from, from culture to culture. But that's fine, and yeah, the the, the book, this is a, a, a project I really wanted to do for a long time. Ever since my first book on on manga, uh, I did in two thousand and four. Yeah, we've got just here. Yeah, uh, which was you know I was very lucky to have a first book that went on to become you know, quite a big selling thing in many countries. Went to about I mean, eleven or twelve languages, um, and for many people, and for myself, frankly, it was a kind of way of making some kind of okay, what it sent, some kind of mapping, some sort of understanding of of Japanese comics. I wanted to come back to it, but not just repeat what I've done. And also, in the meantime, I've been constantly exploring comic cultures from uh, around the world. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, basically insatiable. I, I'm, my, my, I kind of vaguely envisage my deathbed scene being people bringing silver platters of more comics that I've not seen <laughs> to the very end. Now, you've never seen this one, have you? An obscure comic from, I don't know, um, Transylvania or something yeah. <laughs> I've never seen. Um, and certainly when it comes to com comic cultures of Asia, they are complex and rich and, and var hugely varied. Um, but I've wanted to try and bring them together uh, into one overarching exhibition. Uh, one of my the biggest uh, academic experts on this vast area of the world and, and its comics and comics 
cartooning and animation, etc., is John A. Lent, who is uh, who runs the International Journal of Comic Art and is a, a friend and colleague, and uh, really has paved the way for this this field to be really opened up. Uh, he produced a very good book, an academic book for the University of Press of Mississippi, uh, called Asian Comics. Um, that was all the middle. It came out actually during the process of me formulating what we're going to do with this with this project, and he very sensibly uh, <laughs> omitted manga because manga is such an enormous subject and not just a subject the medium the, yeah. the industry is just ridiculously huge and complicated and by moving it out of the scene you could then look at each country country by country in this book and really kind of go into detail about it um and he's done a fantastic that is the bible that is the starting point for everybody to kind of get a handle on what, what's happened in these countries but i felt that you can't exclude manga. I mean, he doesn't exclude manga, of course, because it's an influence. It's I mean, permeating through all those countries. And it's yeah. not, of course, just the medium. It's the fact is that you know, Japan's had a fairly substantial impact on many countries. It's occupied them, invaded them, colonized them. It has obviously huge imperial ambitions. Much of them were, were achieved in the early part of the 20th century. And then, of course, it collapsed, of course, with their defeat in the Second World War. Um, but that impact continues even post the Second World War. And so I wanted, was thinking more of a, th- a sort of thematic approach, which is, what, which is what I've taken in, in the book. And that enables you to really put interesting juxtapositions and really kind of contrast different versions of, for example, of history or different versions of legends or myths or folk tales that, that, of course, are not confined usually just to one country. They move around, they're, they're, they're permeable, uh, and they're endlessly being reinterpreted. And so it really kind of enriches the way you can present the work. And also, of course, to be honest, it disguises the fact that actually there's still an awful lot of manga in this book. <laughs> and <it's, laughs> yeah. there's a lot less, say, from smaller countries where, frankly, the culture is less developed. Um, the other reason for doing it, I guess, was also that I, over the years, of course, I've also, in exploring this, been looking at quite a few exhibitions. There have been fairly major ones done at the Angoulême Comics Festival in France on uh, specific countries. They've had guest countries for, like Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Korea, for example. A very important one was done in, by Korea, South Korea in 2003, which really, for everybody, it was like, oh, my gosh, we didn't know all this was going on. Why didn't yeah. we know about this? And it led to a profusion of, of uh, manhua, as, as the Koreans call them, uh, being translated um, and was thought to be maybe this is like the next wave. You know, at first it was manga, then it was manhua. Now, these shows are very good, and I learn a lot from them, and they're obviously great kind of national surveys, but they also come with a problem. They're often government-backed. They're often kind of export-driven. Yeah. They're kind of like marketing, you know, and they're often kind of slightly desperate because they all want to be, you know, we're the next manga. You like manga, you'll like us. And it's a well-known fact that when Korea relaxed its restrictions on Japanese imported pop culture, including manga, which previously had been available basically only in pirate or traced off or illegal editions, the kind of compensation to the local comic creators for this sort of allowing the floodgates to open, as it were, for, for manga into Korea, into South Korea, was that the government said, well, we're going to really push your stuff. You know, we're going to make sure that the world knows about Korean comics. And there was a, a kind of strategy to say, well, you know, we can make manhwa the next thing. Everyone will be talking about, I, yes, I like read manhwa. And that was the plan. Unfortunately, here we are, sort of some 14 years later, or, or later, later and I'm afraid it's not gone that quite that way. And it's a shame. I mean, I was even invited out to Korea to try and help them <laughs> sort yeah. of suggest ways of how do you compete with manga. And, uh, I mean, I didn't have very many good ideas. The main thing was just, you know, do your own thing. Don't try and just imitate manga. That would be the mistake to do, to, to do that. But that's, that's the problem. How do we get people interested in these other kinds of comics? And it has to be said also that... One of the problems with manga is it can become, um, for, 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 internet, for global readers, who is outside Japan, it can become something where you, I, I, I like or dislike it. It's very, it can be very polarizing. Oh, I'm quite aware, yeah. Yeah, yeah. there are people that, are, that just will say, I don't like manga, which is all like saying, I don't like all the entirety of, of American comics or any comic from Europe, for example, which is kind of slightly close-minded, obviously, I feel. Um, and it is a kind of misunderstanding just how... There's such a huge spectrum of work uh, in, in Japan. I mean, there's bound to be. It's, it's the biggest industry in the world. Um, it's the most liberal. It's the most expressive in terms of violence and sex, which we have to face up to and say, well, yes, okay, that's that's a space to, to deal with these subjects. And as a result, the the, the, the the material is hugely diverse and there is something for everybody if they can get past that kind of, I don't know manga because it looks like such and such. Big eyes. The big giant, eyes and, yeah, and all, yeah. the, all the, 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 the hoary cliches about it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so the, the, in a long, to sum up, basically the idea is to kind of 
bring people in through manga to Asia. That's why the, the two words are put together. Mm -hmm. And um, the the brilliant opportunity... I'm sorry, I haven't even given you a pause for a question here, but then, I mean, you know, <laughs> we haven't got very much time, have we? And, That's all right. You know, you've got to ask us, so tell me about the book. And yeah. I, <laughs> I figured you'd be able I, to. I'm, don't, I'm don't terrible at this. Yeah. I'm terrible. I haven't even had a cup of coffee this morning. I don't oh, even drink. amazing. I don't, even, I don't even drink coffee. Oh, okay. I am naturally caffeinated. And, and you're running high on manga. Yeah, I am a bit, a actually. Yeah. Yes, I am a bit, yeah. <laughs> Is there a Manga America? Well, there would, there could be. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you, the, part of the aspect of the, of the of calling it this is to show that how obviously manga has influenced and has had a big influence on other cultures and other, other and it certainly has influenced, of course, American comics. Uh, it's influenced comics almost everywhere it's gone uh, and online in a big way too. Um, I suppose the point is I, that was part of a, the a theme that I'd already felt I would covered, and I didn't want to get. We had to kind of focus in on what is this project about, yeah. and if you get too diffuse and you end up. Um, uh, talking about its impact globally or something, or even too much, too much beyond beyond the borders of the region of Asia, then uh, yeah, it, it just gets too too much to, 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 too much material to even make yeah. sense of it. Um, but as far as sequels go, yeah, I don't know. I've got there's, there's plenty of the world that hasn't been covered. Yeah. I've got lots of things I want to still want to do. I mean, one of my projects is definitely on Mexican comics. I'm not sure mm -hmm. how it's going to happen yet because the story hasn't actually quite got the point where it need, really needs to be told. It does need to be told, but the but, current but scene... The structure for the, it is... Well, you know, the current scene is a little bit... I'm waiting. I was there for the first time for a week in uh, in March and got to see amazing archives. I've got to see meet some very promising artists. There are just a few people coming through, but we need you know something to happen where you go, OK, there's a resurgence, because mm -hmm. it would be a sad story to say Mexico had, a, again, one of the biggest, world's well, biggest ever comic cultures. I mean... Just briefly, one of the lovely stories I have is that there's a magazine that ran for nearly 8,000 issues and it was published every day. It was a little kind of... It was a proper magazine with about maybe 64, 90 pages, something like that, of different serialised stories. And whereas we think of, OK, you do a daily, daily serial, that's going to be like four panels in a newspaper strip. In Mexico, it would be maybe sort of 8, 12, 16 pages of a little booklet yeah. coming out every day Jeez. and even better twice on sunday <laughs> and when i was in <laughs> yeah. in mexico city i managed to go they went to this wonderful libreria del labyrinto which was literally a labyrinthine bookshop and hidden away in a mezzanine i had to climb up on a ladder to get to it were bound volumes of these not of course done officially done by by just by fans by readers wanting to keep there these huge piles of uh, of the pepin magazine and of course one volume might be sort of you know a chunky sort of couple of inches thick but it might only have about about two weeks worth or even a week's <laughs> worth of the, of the comics in them and there were in there there were two issues from sunday i thought how does how's it possible to bring out two issues on a sunday so that that's a vast amount of material that that's, has been analysed by experts, but I don't feel you know, their role is extreme, crucial, obviously, mm -hmm. and archivists and all this. But a lot of the time, it can be a bit hidden away, a bit dusty, a bit. We know about this stuff, but how do you communicate it? And how do you get it out to a right, wider public to, to In take a sense, an interest? Is it, is it similarly you need somebody like Lent to have done some of the academic that, groundwork yeah, to, I, to build on? I dedicate the book to to, to Lent and also to uh, Frederick Schott, of course, who was. Mm -hmm crucial to everybody, I think, understanding manga outside in, in England, in the English language, and also to Helen uh, McCarthy, who is an equivalent here in the UK, especially for anime, but also manga. We need these people, and I'm not the academic. I kind of... I, That's I, what I wonder. I don't mean it in a disparaging no, way, no, no, but I'm not. in a sense I would where tell you need the, the yeah. academic to kind of do that you need basic that, research. You, you before need the you research. Can, yeah. You also need the archive, the material you can actually look at. Yeah. But sometimes someone like myself can come in and then go, OK, now, that hasn't been said, that hasn't been seen, but what about these observations? because I'm trying to take this absurd overview of looking at everything, yeah. um, which is dangerous, of course. I mean, I, get, I, might, I might get so remote and have such an overview, I'm, I can't see anything anymore because it's all so... Yeah. so the 30,000-foot so, view turns into 300,000 feet. And, yes, yeah. it gets a bit hard to see things in detail. Yeah. But sometimes the detail is, it, it does make a difference, and, and I, can, I can bring that bigger kind of connectivity, hopefully, the vision of connectivity between all this work and see something mm -hmm. and say something too. And also, most importantly... My books are, are for a general audience. I mean, their print runs are in thousands. I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, but I know I've 
I've contributed a few um, pieces to academic work. Sometimes it's just things that I've already written, for example. And the print runs are really, you know, teeny tiny. Yeah. And I and I was quite set back. But of course, then you think that well, the audience is limited. The uh, and these are probably print on demand type of books or right. bought by libraries. They often cost like sixty dollars for a hardback or something. And um, the, the, yeah, and they're very important books, but they're also often not read by very many people. Right. And that's where the my the mission is to kind of bridge the, the these worlds and get that work, get people to hear about it, and hopefully also follow up. Mm-hmm. Uh, country that surprised you the most? Let me think. Um, that's yeah, I suppose probably it is. <clears throat> it is actually Korea, <clears throat> South Korea, North Korea. Obviously, is also a surprise for most people because most people don't even believe they that they would have them have comics. They do, but they're extremely propagandistic, as you might imagine, extremely controlled, and there's no room for anything that doesn't conform to the great leader's views. In fact, the great leader writes or has written the the stories based on a lot of them. Um, he doesn't actually appear, by the way, in any of the comics because uh, it's, it's not seemly. You know, uh-huh. he's, he's, it's, it's not <laughs> like... I mean, obviously, there are plenty of portraits of, of him in uh, idealised yeah. paintings and things, but to have him reduced to, to a mere comic would, wouldn't be wouldn't be the right thing to do. So when he has appeared or is referred to, sometimes I've noticed in one or two, um, there are, he appears as a kind of glowing, sort of like the sun, essentially. Oh, I was going to go with the Jack Chick... You know, God yes. with no face exactly. and all that. that yeah. kind yeah. of, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> the, the, this sort of force of nature yeah. kind of thing, a force of benevolence, supposedly. Um, but I was lucky to learn about those. Uh, I met a couple of experts. We didn't have any contacts within North Korea. And that's what I should a- a- emphasize here. As well as building on the academic world, it's also built, this book is built, an exhibition too, are built on uh, obviously years of networking and years of finding amazing um, collectors and uh, explorers of comics in, in all of these regions. And so a team of around 20 plus people helped with the book and also with um, with the exhibition that's gone with it. And I'm mentioning also in Korea, South Korea is, even though I've said, okay, we aren't all reading Manwa, there is some really, really strong work and it's just for some reason not easy for it to cross over. Some of it might just be that it's very cultural specific, but I think, for example, John Corkley just re- recently released a, a wonderful graphic novel from South Korea called Uncomfortably Happily. Yeah. Um, I can't quite remember the. This is the other problem, by the way, with um, Korean uh, comics. I, names it's, it's the probably, names. Yeah. You can't get. You should get too wrong if you say Park or Lee, but or uh, Kim, but, yeah, or Kim, of course, yeah. yes, of course, Kim. But uh, now this is. I shouldn't say this, but it is. You know, there's a problem there, of course, of getting people to remember people's uh, the artists' names. But it's really a wonderful autobiographical story for like three or four hundred pages long. And the thing that excited me most about Korean comics also uh, wa- has been the, the, the this extraordinary change. It is the it's a it's a uh, only thing I've seen anywhere in the world quite like it, where you have a culture that, in the late ninety, even as late as the late nineties or so, um, the uh, very kind of conservative governments would be would hold on their f- family values day, which I believe was sometime in the early May, May fifth or something like this. It's a day for celebrating family values. Yes, of course we need that. Um, they would obviously target sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but also comics, definitely as being like the, the, the absolute <laughs> you know anathema, the absolute poison of society, and they would actually hold this is like well we're not not in the 1950s here or even during the nazi era you know they would have public burnings of bad manwa manwa that's the old term for comics but then here we are some sort of 20 years later and even i mean sooner than this the the whole change happened more like in around 2000 or the early 2000s korea south korea being such an internet connected society wi-fi everywhere uh, everyone on them on their smartphones and things um a whole new form of comics took him took over but beca- partly because korea's kind of almost led the way by having just print comics and certainly print if not print magazines but print comics just vanishing just mm-hmm. dying not helped, obviously, by this terrible PR for them, of course. Um, not all on the, on the, on the funeral pyres of, of the government. Um, but they did have a very bad reputation. And But what turned this all around is having these webtoons, these vertical scrolling stories that you can read for free on your mobile phone, especially as you're, if you're stuck on a commuter train. And... Um, there's a whole bunch of artists literally transferred to this form, but also a lot of very interesting new artists came in. And because it was on the internet, there was a bit more freedom. This is one of the things. I mean, uh, Korean society is a little is constrained, if yeah. not a little bit even slightly constipated in terms of having these kind of conservative values and a lot of other things that just hold it back. They certainly haven't got the freedom of Japan, of course. Um, but un- with the internet comics, there was more freedom. There was more 
tolerance of strange stories, strange drawing styles, the format of literally only having one panel moving up onto your little screen and then you're moving one at a time. It, obviously, it's not the page anymore. It's not the, you can surprise with every individual panel. It's no longer yeah. just, I must wait to, till the turn of the page to give you a surprise. Um, and, of course, you can use all sorts of, if you want to, gimmicks, you know, like adding vibrations or sounds or little gifts and this kind of little images in them. Even one lovely scene, one effect they've done is when you have a change of location, when the image comes up on your screen, it's actually layered and has a kind of almost sort of antique Disney movie kind of, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of plain kind of system they used to use for doing 3D sort of yeah. effects in, in Snow White or Pinocchio or something like that. And they're really, it's, it's nice. But beyond that, more importantly, it's not just a new new format, a new readership. It, the content is what's really made a difference. And this, again, maybe is only possible and specific to Korea. And that's because a lot of the, the mass media, um, uh, news media, etc., you know, is uh, pretty much in cahoots with those in power, whether it's the corporations or the yeah, government. That's largely that's been my interpretation of Korean culture. That yeah. Business and politics are... It's very, very tied well, up. Yeah. Very tied up. And as it's not obviously only in South Korea, it's happening, happening everywhere, really. But um, but it does mean that this these comics are an are a avenue, an outlet for criticism. Sometimes not uh, oblique, but still it's there. They're, they're addressing issues of corruption, issues of corporate exploitation, for example. I mean, there's one wonderful uh, um, graphic novel called Dust Free Room, which began as a, as a webcomic, a webtoon, which deals with Samsung, the Samsung Corporation's avoidance of responsibility for the, uh, the deaths from leukemia of many of their workers making these... Know, the chips and everything the chips, else. Basically, yeah. yes, yeah. In, the, in, the, in these dust-free rooms. Um, and, and, of course, the public are responding to this because this is like, oh, my gosh, this is actually talking about something that I don't read somewhere else. They're getting really addicted. I mean, I've heard figures of 10 or 12 million a day, uh, people downloading their favourite episodes. Yeah. And the artists are, are earning. Um, the other unique thing to South Korea's uh, boom is that the comics are, lo are often are put out through major portals that we don't really have so much, I don't think, in well, elsewhere. They are one's called Neve and one's called Daum. And they're basically one place you go to do everything, as mm -hmm. opposed to sort of moving from Facebook to Twitter, Instagram, it's all consolidated. And they have big money and they finance putting up these this you know, exclusive content. And there also are pay for pay for ones which are more adult, uh, which again is allowing for some slightly more interesting content too. So all in all, it's an extremely important bit. And even and because they're so popular, they're being made into TV shows and movies. And when they're made into these uh, productions, the public is very attached to these stories. They don't want them messed around with. They want them to be completely yeah. faithful. Yeah. So when they advertise them, for example, you'll have the drawing of the characters next to photographs of the people to make sure it's okay, they've, <laughs> yeah, got, the right, the right they've right got the right look. <laughs> yeah. But it's... And who could have made... I could, you couldn't have made, made that up. That is like, okay, that's a culture that was burning comics only about 20 years ago and now consuming them and adapting them. And, and of course, the main thing is people saying, oh, no, I, I don't read manhwa, I read, me, I read webtoons. And it's, it's because the, the yeah. things is not seen as... Almost even it's the same thing, of course, to a large extent. Yeah. So that's interesting. Culturally, it that's has a long answer. But I would say Korea is still, for the future, it may be it's one. It's one future that much might replicate somewhere else. But it's got so many unique circumstances. It's just maybe too special. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to run out of time. But it's been four years since you've been on, mm. which I know it's it's because that was yeah that was twenty thirteen. It's the beginning of twenty fourteen. Fourteen. So I, I just, just quit yeah. my job that weekend and, yes. and sure that previous week and then showed up in England. Congrats to you for and, these last four years. Yeah, then. it's, it's yeah. been insane. But but thank you. Um, <laughs> but in a good way. But how have things changed? What's gone on for you in yeah. the past couple of years? It's been just onward and upwards, really, and to quote uh, Stan the Man. I mean, it has been a wonderful... I'm in an incredibly lucky place. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I really do have to pinch myself every day because, you know, here I am. I mean, you know, talking to you is great fun, and, and I, I'm going to be talking in a while to a Brazilian newspaper about Will Eisner, uh, for example. <laughs> and I think, I mean, I, and I'm, I don't always get paid. That isn't even important to me because I'm doing something I absolutely love and know... As I think I said before, this is why I'm here. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I think probably, you know, you're, this is probably why you're here as well, actually. You're doing something that adds to the world and maybe changes the world a little bit too. Um, and I think comics are doing that. I think comics are at an amazing time right now. Um, there are still battles to be won. I do see it slightly as a, slightly as a bit of a campaign here because, uh, 
having done, for example, with John Harris Dunning, the British Library show, that clearly had a, a big impact here in, in, in the, the UK. You were working on when I, or exactly. there was going to debut when we met in fourteen. Yeah, that happened over the summer of 2014. It was called Comics Unmasked, Art and Anarchy in the UK. Mm-hmm. And as, as always, we added, you know, edge and um, sort of nerve. Um, but it, it has had an interesting effect because one of our... Dave McKean actually came up with the the graphic design for the show, but also came up with a wonderful touch to end the show, which was to end with... uh, It was a a drawing board, or an easel, essentially, with uh, a a one-month calendar on it, and just with one date uh, circled and saying, um, um, start my new comic. And, of course, that was lovely, (laughs) because it actually had the double meaning, obviously. It could be, okay, you start reading a new comic, but also you could start making a new comic. Mm -hmm. And certainly John and I both felt that doing the show, we didn't want to just do a sort of literary kind of troll saying, yes, comics are the new literature, blah, blah, here we are in the British Library, nor do we want to do a sort of nostalgia trip. And we did a quite edgy show. We actually we upset people deliberately. We had one wonderful negative review in uh, the Sunday Times, their, their culture section, where... Valdemar Genucek, who's actually a very, very good art critic, but has has some slight blind spots, um, really slammed into the show, into us, actually. (laughs) And, I mean, the headline was Trash Bang Wallop rather than Trash Bang Wallop. (laughs) And because he really didn't like the fact that we looked at these sort of darker, difficult sides of comics and weren't just doing the the pop culture-y, fun, pop arty kind of side of things. Um, But but in in many ways, I think we have kind of won the literary aspect, the literary sort of respect for comics. Comics. That's pretty much, you know, not going to be, not going to be. It can't be squashed. It can't be turned yeah. back. <clears throat> but I think, you know, one of the big battles remains: how do we present comics and integrate comics into the art world and, and into art history? And I'm really exploring that. I've been exploring that for some time now, but I'm still thinking this is something that needs to be done. And I wouldn't say any more than that. I've just got an idea of how we do this mm-hmm. and a possible, certainly a source of an incredible collection that could be presented but needs to be obviously in a prestige venue that, that that is prepared to go, OK, we're going to really do this and not just do it as a kind of one-off, you know, family fun summer show where we can get the kids in, you know, we yeah. can do some workshops and Look, hey, we've, got, we've got Batman on the wall or something like that. I mean, obviously, Masters of Comic Art that was done in L.A. a few years back that Art Spiegelman was, was, the, was the instigator, I believe, of it in two major museums. That was one thing. It was obviously only American for a start. Um, but they did do a very important job. But I still think it didn't perhaps turn things around. And it's, uh, it's, it's a question of how we also can bring in the, the art practitioners, artists, fine artists who are clearly influenced and even not just influenced, are making comics, not just in a kind of Lichtenstein kind of way, but actually doing narrative. So, for example, there was a really inspiring show I've heard about and been in touch with in Perth, uh, and it's, it's a Western Australian museum of art or something. A uh, curator there called Robert Cook, who did a show just recently called Comics Tragics that involved people like Ron Reedy Jr., uh, Anders Nielsen, but also other other interesting artists, Stephen Collins from the UK, for example. Um, and it was it was really used the gallery the challenges of this, these ridiculous art gallery spaces that are clearly not conducive to showing little tiny pages of comic artwork. Yeah. Um, really you know, used it really powerfully and convinced, convincingly. And I think that is a thing a goal for mine over the next five ten years. I think if I can keep going doing this <laughs> to try and do something that does really make a change as opposed to just being a kind of novelty or a, an indulgence mm-hmm. by the art world. You do still seem to have a lot of energy. <laughs> I, I, I give you credit. So, yeah, I'm going to know. keep going. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll keep going as long as I can, hopefully. Yeah. They keep, um, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. You're about to, I was going yeah. to say, if they keep paying you, you keep going. But sometimes, like in this case, you know, I'm not paying anybody anything. And, Aren't you? You know. Oh, oh I, I give you some nice postcards. That's, oh, uh, your postcards. I paid in postcards. <laughs> yeah. <see? laughs> no, no, I'm, 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 yeah, that's not the, the point. Yeah. I think things come back to yeah. you, whatever you do, whether you're paid or not. Yeah. Yeah, and I've had luck in the last uh, four years since we last spoke to also co-curate some fun shows. I did a show about uh, January or February or so last year here in London at the House of Illustration, which is a really nice venue, quite a new one near King's Cross, devoted to illustration. Small, but beautifully formed. Um, and with, with Oliver, Olivia Ahmad, who's the curator, we co-curated a show called Comics with an X, Comics Creatrix. Mm-hmm. That's your new word for the day. If you want okay. to use it, you're welcome to use it. It should become part of the language. Um, it obviously was a little bit naughty because it has the IX ending, which we know it, people immediately think 
like dominatrix, but I said, no, no, like aviatrix and yeah. proprietrix and these kind of words. <laughs> but uh, it was a hundred women making comics, and it, it wasn't an idea I came up with. It wasn't an idea maybe I would have come up with, but it, it was. It suddenly made you go, okay, let's just let's put all the men out of the way. It was actually incredibly <laughs> freeing to then go, what is there? And you think, my gosh, there's so much. Trust me, yeah. You, when you realize the the cocoon that you're in, yeah. You know, your own biases. I, mm. I, you know, the show invariably is two, it's it's basically two-thirds male. Anytime mm. I look back at a calendar of, of the year, it'll be 65% male, 35% female. Mm. Um, even worse, people of color. Yes. I can go long stretches sure. without realizing that, oh, I have only had white guests for two years straight. And right. you just don't realize it yeah, when you're yeah. inside that that. Yeah, you have to. Be, cocoon, I mean, you have so. to make a push for diversity and, yeah. and inclusivity as much as you can, and that, not just sit back and just follow the. Just, just, just come together like that. And it was actually very freeing. We the show was a hundred artists. Obviously, we didn't have much more than maybe a couple of pages at most from each, but because the gallery is quite small, but it enabled us to really uh, present a, a huge panoply. We had a huge loan from Trina Robbins, who, of course, is the yeah. Yeah. historian of comics. Uh, it's a wonderful early material. But we also have, for example, work by Tove Janssen, uh, the creator of The Moomins, who's currently got a major show on, yeah. just opened it, Dulwich Picture Gallery here, and she's getting you know, ma huge recognition for her work. Um, and we had some lovely... What was the best thing about it was that we were able to bring... we we'll kind of span and connect the generations, especially especially in the UK, where there are artists like Nicola Lane, for example, drawing in the 70s, who had been pretty much forgotten. We managed to just squeeze her into the Comets on Mars show, but she hadn't, she hadn't been reprinted. Her work was very, very innovative and, uh, and important. And we, so it meant that while we could include current, for example, British women graphic novelists, they would then connect to previous, uh, one or two or three generations from before, and it made a, a wonderful atmosphere. And, of course, the great fortune we had was that it coincided with um, the Angolan Festival's um, complete balls up yeah, of, um, yeah. uh, of omitting <laughs> any woman from their shortlist of, um, of uh, Grand Prix Lifetime Achievement Awards. that's only because they weren't good enough. As, um, as they, no, then, I they then kept digging themselves a, a deeper I hole. Actually on, think on, it, <laughs> I don't think it was deliberate. I actually yeah. just think it was one of those things where, again, they were just kind of in the cocoon and, yeah. oh, we, haven't, we hadn't realised we'd, we'd done it. And they made it worse by then trying to insert people after and it just made it just yeah. was a shambles. <laughs> um, but it, it highlighted, of course, it, it, it helped the show a lot. Uh, to, and, and it was a very important um, model for shows, which, were, which other, we hope have already been replicated a bit in, for example, in Australia, there was an equivalent, and we think it's the kind of thing that should be done everywhere. Mm -hmm. And probably, obviously, not just for comics by women, but comics by many other underrepresented uh, uh, sectors of society, um, to realise not that there's a lot going on now, but there have been people before them, and maybe yeah. people obviously aren't even alive, of course. There is a history, there is a, or a history, or whatever you want to call it, yeah. that can be joined up, and that only should encourage, you know, current practitioners to feel they're part of a legacy and a heritage. Maybe yeah. this will be our, our occasion to finally get you over to the States again. Yeah, I'm thinking next year I will have to go, uh, partly because my brother's just moved house and I want to go and see where he's living. He's downsized from 20 acres to a mere two acres. I don't know how he's going to manage. I mean, you know. If you're going to be enough. around New York and New Jersey, that's that's our thing. We have to get together for real sometime. Because we keep to. cramming in these, you know, uh, every couple of years, you know, yes, sit down. We, we need to yes. have a, a... Yeah, I do intend to. I do intend yeah. to very much. And I do have another project, um, which is not super secret yet, uh, particularly. It's uh, over, the next, over the next two years, I'm going to be working closely with the wonderful Posey Simmons, um, who uh, has a new serial, a new book uh, coming out by the autumn of next year. Uh, this is basically to do a lovely big retrospective and to do one, possibly even two books um, with her as well. She's one of my favorite guests. Yeah, um, she's, she, she was a, a wonder to sit down with. Absolutely. So, she's yeah. huge fun. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paul, I got to run off to the next one, but you sound like you've got enough stuff to keep you occupied. <laughs> I'm going to keep busy <laughs> and, and enjoy it. Cool. Thanks so much for coming on the show again. Thank you for reminding me, Gil. Thank you. And that was Paul Gravette. His website is paulgravette.com, which is P-A-U-L-G-R-A-V-E-T-T dot com. And his new book is Mangasia, The Definitive Guide to Asian Comics from Thames and Hudson. The exhibition for Mangasia is currently at Palazzo della Esposizione in Rome, but will tour in 2018 and beyond. And once we wrapped up the main session, I asked both Eshkol and Paul, so, who are you reading? If you want to hear their answers to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. 
The newest episode of that went up recently with extra material from guests like Howard Chaikin, Joyce Farmer, Ben Schwartz, Ellen Forney, Matt Ruff, Patty Farmer, Sven Burkertz, Gordon Van Gelder, Ellen Datlow, Kathy Bidas, John Clute, Mimi Pond, and Matt Worker. You can get access by supporting the show at patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, series of ebooks that I someday will get around to launching, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. I recorded the segment with Eshkol at the Rocking Horse Cafe in Manhattan, so that was $10 at the GW, $6 for subway fare, about 30 bucks for parking. The segment with Paul Gravette was part of my London trip in October, and my company covered most of the airfare, except for 275 bucks when I decided to come home early because I miss my wife, uh, and I stayed with John and Judith Clute, so there was no hotel to cover. Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the Virtual Memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Kevin Katila, John Wendler, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Stephen Nadler, Wallace Wilde Minozzi, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Garrett Zecker, Craig P. Steffen, Jack Lescamella, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have a full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Have a happy Thanksgiving, and thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Eddie Portnoy, author of the new book, Bad Rabbi, and other strange but true stories from the Yiddish press. Until next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store, or by visiting soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get in our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. Or go to YouTube and search for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for us. That'll help build a bigger audience. Till next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. <laughs>